So, good evening, good afternoon and good morning, dear colleagues and friends from all over the world. My name is Oleg Mushkerov and I am the director of the International Center for Mathematical Sciences in Sofia, Bulgaria. Today is a very special day for the Bulgarian mathematical community and at the moment we all feel sad and happy at the same time. Sad because a year and a week ago Academician Blagoves Sendov passed away and we lost a brilliant mathematician, a dear colleague, teacher and a friend of ours. At the same time, we are extremely happy because an outstanding mathematician, Professor Terence Tao, is among us to present his breakthrough contribution to the proof of the famous Sendov's conjecture. Thank you very much, Professor Tao, for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Now I will give the floor to three mathematicians, one physicist and one charming policy maker to say a few words in memory of Academician Sandov. Academician Kenderov, you have the floor, please. Thank you, thank you, Oleg. Blagoves Sendov was a unique person. We, his students, colleagues and friends, admire him not only for his mathematical contributions and for building up the approximation theory school in Bulgaria, but also for what he did for the entire Bulgarian mathematical community and, and for the whole society. I'll list only three things. 25 years ago, before continental Europe accepted the three-level university education with bachelor, master and doctor degree, Sendov introduced and implemented this system in the Bulgarian mathematics and informatics education, which was quite unusual in those times. As early as the beginning of uh, 80s last century, Sendov had the vision for the use of computers in education and conducted a large-scale school experiment with style of teaching and learning based on inquiry and understanding, which was also very novel in those times. Well before the democratization of the political life in 1989, he introduced the so-called grant system for funding research projects. For the first time, a large group of projects leaders got the right and simultaneously the responsibility to operate with financial and other resources. This was a democratization of Bulgarian science in the sense that a large group of people uh, was granted the right to make decisions. Last but not least, it doesn't happen very often to have around somebody who, at different stages of life, was president of the largest educational institution in Bulgaria, Sofia University, president of the largest research institution in Bulgaria, Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, President of the National Parliament, Ambassador of Bulgaria in Japan, and a key person in several international organizations. The expertise and wisdom he had will be a good pattern to follow for the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Academician Kenderov. Now we will hear Academician Ivan Todorov, who is presently in Paris, and who sent us a recording. Blagoves Tsendov was an aspiring young mathematician, age 26, when he made his conjecture. At 87, he was enthusiastic. He was the Bulgarian soul of the then projected International Center for Mathematical Sciences. We are fortunate to have Terence Tao, a bright star in the world of mathematics, to speak today about Sandov's conjecture. I believe that Blago would have been glad to observe this event from somewhere. 
our gratitude to academician Todorov. And now I pass the baton to Professor Lyudmil Katsarkov, who is the scientific director of our international center. Please, Lyudmil. All right, thank you, uh, Oleg. Yeah, I uh, met uh, uh, Academician Sandov uh, when we started working on the creation of uh, International uh, uh, Center for uh, Mathematical Sciences in Sofia. And in fact, uh, it was suggested uh, uh, to me to work with him by Sir Michael Atia. And so the way Atia introduced uh, uh, was Sandov to me was as follows. He said, you really have a huge uh, help uh, down in Sofia. Uh, in fact, uh, in Bulgaria, you have the greatest uh, politician among mathematicians. And I actually decided to tease Atiyah and ask him better than Hirzebruch. And Atiyah said, well, it's easy to be a politician in Germany. And it's much harder to be a politician in Eastern Europe where everyone is uh, ready to stab you in the back. That's what Atiyah said. But in any case, his suggestion was really a great one and uh, the center was created. And uh, at the very beginning, uh, Academician Sendov was able to uh, arrange some deals with uh, some uh, American institutions. And so I would like to give the opportunity to uh, the director of uh, IMSA in Miami who has arranged some deal with the Academician Center to say a couple of words about it. Steve? Thank you, Ludmil. Welcome to everyone from uh, today, sunny Miami. Um, I'm delighted to be here in, at this event and to say just a few short words. Um, I was very fortunate to get to meet Academician Sendoff in September of 2019 when we were having the uh, formal event starting our new Institute of the Mathematical Sciences of the Americas, which we are hoping to have be not only a force for uh, advancement in mathematics and its applications across the Americas, but also globally. And as part of that, and at, in no small part in, uh, as a result of some of the discussions and dinners that I had with Professor Sendoff while he was here, we began working on 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 a uh, what we're calling the IMSA consortium, of which the ICMS is a charter member. And in fact, our our, our collaboration, we hope uh, expect next year to have a jointly mentored. Um, um, postdoctoral scholar spending the part of time here in Miami and then also in Sofia. We're very excited about that prospect and and I expect that uh, academician Sindoff would be very uh, happy about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And uh, I would like to give the opportunity to uh, Professor Philip Griffiths, uh, uh, one of the most uh, notorious and most famous geometers of 20th and 21st century, a director of uh, director emeritus of Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, to say a couple of words uh, about academician Sendoff. Philip, thank you, Lord Bill. Um, Sendoff was one of the leading mathematicians in the Balkans. I think, to me, especially impressive was the very broad view. Uh, he had of mathematics, um, very specific problems dealing with zeros of polynomials, uh, mathematical biology, all the way to computer science. Um, also, I think very impressive and very important was, as was mentioned earlier, the substantial school of students that he was instrumental in uh, helping to establish. Uh, we met here in Miami, as Steve said, at the opening of IMSA, the inaugural event, and uh, I, I found a lot in common with, uh, with Akademisten Sendoff. Uh, we met both professionally and socially, and uh, you know, it was a great pleasure uh, on both counts. 
it's clear that he has had immense experience in as, uh, organizing science and uh, has proven leadership. We discussed the collaboration that Steve mentioned between IMSA here in Miami and ICMS and Sophia. And I'm delighted to see that this is progressing very nicely. So again, uh, it's a fact that we are now, I think, um, collaborating uh, institutions, uh, organizations, and to look forward to, um, to a, a very promising future of um, this collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, <laughs> Uh, Minister uh, Karina Angelieva, who would like to say a couple of words about Academician Center. Karina. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank, thanks really for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Can you hear me first? Yep. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, really a great honor uh, for me, and maybe I'm the, the only one not mathematician probably <laughs> today to join this uh, great event, uh, to share my uh, memories of uh, Academician Sandhoff, maybe you'll be surprised, but I met him only two years ago, uh, when we start to work uh, together and to discuss uh, reforms that are needed in the research and innovation sector in Bulgaria, and as uh, Professor Katsalkov already said, we start um, this ambitious goal to establish International Center of Mathematics in Bulgaria. But basically, uh, the name of uh, the academician Sandhoff uh, for all my wife, because uh, already in primary school, I was the first generation of kids to uh, enter uh, into a pilot school, uh, modeling uh, his uh, new approach on education. It was called the Sandhoff system on education. And I was very lucky because I was not uh, even supposed to write with pencil but uh, already in the first year in school i was uh, using a computer uh, later unfortunately this system was not uh, largely scaled and uh, now in the COVID times uh, all the discussions for uh, changes uh, necessary in the education system also revoke uh, these ideas that uh, uh, send of uh, already uh, uh, was doing it basically, not only talking about them. Uh, you can imagine how many years ago. And uh, of course, uh, in this now honorable group of uh, uh, very famous people uh, that uh, remind ourselves that the Commission Sandhoff also was a great uh, uh, person to um, work for the image of Bulgaria, uh, no matter that uh, we were at uh, some point of uh, ah, uh, in, uh, the communist yeah. system, but he was a great ambassador uh, uh -huh. to Japan, and uh, overall, I must say, he was a great science diplomat all over the world. Uh, so these are my um, memories. I really regret that uh, we couldn't finalize with him one reform we started. Um, but uh, I'm still inspired uh, from him and uh, I'm following his approach to work with young people. So my ambition is really to, to support the young generation of people to uh, follow a career in mathematics uh, and uh, to develop their, uh, their talents. So this is for me, Academician uh, Sendu. And uh, now here in my library, I have uh, uh, one book he gave me in December 2019, one month before he died. Uh, the book uh, is called The Democracy is Like the Moss. The democracy don't grow somewhere where there is no the right um, environment and the seeds for this. And uh, I think this I will remember and uh, I will follow in uh, all my uh, Activity so a uh, great and uh, great news from uh, uh, Terence Tau that he solved uh, this problem. I'm very intrigued to, to follow this event. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. All right, I think it's time to move now to the star of the show, uh, Professor Terence Tau. Uh, let me say a couple of words. Of course, he is uh, very famous, but uh, for people who haven't heard that. Terence Tao is one of the most prolific mathematicians of our times. 
and so he covers uh, a lot of very broad spectrum of mathematical areas from harmonic analysis to combinatorics and from uh, number theory to partial differential equations. I mean, he is uh, rightfully compared to Mozart of mathematics because of the beauty and elegance of his uh, proofs who are just divine. And so let me let on you, uh, Professor Terence Staus from UCLA, who is going to tell us about his recent approach to Sandoz conjecture for zeros of polynomials. Terry, let me just briefly say that uh, if you have any questions, you can put this uh, uh, into the, um, uh, to send this either uh, to Vilishka Milusheva or just uh, put them in the uh, chat as a question. Thank you. Terry? Okay. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor to, uh, to speak at this event in honor of uh, Academician Sendov. I never unfortunately met uh, uh, Sendov, uh, but uh, he was uh, you know, learning about how remarkable a person was. I, I really regret uh, the opportunity to meet. And I've never actually been uh, to Bulgaria, uh, except that I guess now I am at least virtually uh, visiting, so that, that is very nice. Um, so I think, I don't remember when I first learned about this conjecture, maybe as a graduate student or as, as a postdoc, um, I heard about his famous conjecture in passing, uh, but it wasn't my area. I never really worked in polynomials um, uh, when I was younger. Um, it's only recently in the last few years that uh, I happened to work in the study of random polynomials, polynomials with random coefficients and, and uh, the distribution of the zeros. Um, but even then, I didn't make the connection to uh, to this conjecture that that ideas from probability might be relevant. Um, it, uh, um, it was only actually last uh, in the last few months when I was uh, preparing a, a course, a graduate course on complex analysis, that uh, I, I, uh, I actually came across the conjecture again and uh, realized actually that some of the new techniques in the theory of random polynomials could be used. To, to help attack this conjecture, at least asymptotically. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great demonstration of the unity of mathematics, that, that all areas of mathematics are connected. And so in particular, you will see ideas from probability uh, come in this talk, even though there is no probability initially in Sendov's conjecture. So Sendov's conjecture is one of the basic open questions remaining about um, polynomials of one variable. Um, so if you have a polynomial, let's call it FOC, uh, of, of degree n um, in one complex variable z, we have, of course, the fundamental, oh, this is already a typo, fundamental theorem of algebra, not fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that uh, uh, any such polynomial has got n zeros, lambda 1 to lambda n. Uh, and in this talk, I will consistently try to, to uh, color zeros in red and uh, critical points in blue. Um, so um, we have n zeros, possibly repeated, so there could be multiplicity, and I'll, I'll call them lambda 1 to lambda n. Um, and then there are also uh, some critical points. Uh, critical points are stationary points of, of your polynomial, or zeros of the derivative. Um, and the derivative has degree n minus 1. So there's n minus 1 critical points, and I'm going to call them zeta 1 to zeta n minus 1. Um, and um, these zeros, or critical points, determine the polynomial up to a constant. So uh, it's traditional to normalize the polynomial to be monic, which means the leading coefficient is one. So you can um, write any uh, polynomial f as um, the product of n linear factors, depending on the zeros. And the derivative um, is also a product of, of n minus one linear factors, depending on the critical points. And there's also a constant of n at the front. And um, a basic question in the subject is what is the relationship between the zeros of a polynomial and the critical points? These are the two most important features of a polynomial often. Um, and so how are they related? So there are many, many relationships between them. Um, so first of all, uh, if you actually um, do numerics and you, you plot um, polynomials on computers, uh, you see that there really should be a relationship. So here, here's a picture uh, from actually uh, two other mathematicians, Kulpucho and Seidel, who are working uh, in this random polynomial literature. So what they did here is that they took the unit disk, uh, the disk of radius one, um, and they, 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 um, um, they selected 1,000 points at random. Um, and these are these blue points, um, sorry, the uh, red points actually. Uh, you, you can't see the red points 
most of them because they're actually hidden by the blue points. But they selected 1,000 red points in the disk at random, and then they formed the polynomial with those one, of degree 1,000 with those points as zeros. Uh, so they just you just multiply together 1,000 linear factors and you get this polynomial. Um, and then you take this derivative and you compute the zeros of that. Those are the critical points. So there's 999 critical points and those are in blue. Uh, and what uh, what you find is that the, the, um, the 999 critical points are very, very close in location to the 1,000 zeros. Um, I mean, so much so that you, 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 you can't even see most of these of the zeros in this picture because they're hidden by the um, uh, by the critical points. Um, so there's clearly some relationship, at least uh, on the level of random polynomials. Um, now, if you worked with uh, um, real polynomials, with real zeros, rather than complex polynomials, then of course we have an extremely classical theorem that we teach to first year undergraduates about the relationship between zeros and critical points. Um, and that's Relay's theorem, that when your zeros are real, then between any two um, um, real zeros, you have a real critical point. Okay, so the n minus one critical points are said to interlace the um, uh, um, the zeros. So you know, um, so here we have three zeros and two critical points, and the two critical points just lie between um, th um, the three zeros. So the relationship is very simple, uh, but that's only um, in the case of real zeros. It doesn't work for complex zeros. And I understand actually that one of um, Sendov's motivations in his conjecture was to try to understand what would be a complex variable analog of Relay's theorem. Um, for complex zeros, uh, the most famous uh, result we have is the classical Gauss-Lucas theorem. Um, so there is um, um, so there is a basic relationship between the zeros and the critical points, which is that the critical points lie in the convex hull of the zero. So you, you find the smallest convex polygon that contains the zeros, and that also contains the critical points. Um, and this is uh, um, this is uh, something that you can you can prove to an undergraduate complex analysis class. Um, if you start from factoring your function f as the product of linear factors depending on zeros, you can take the logarithmic derivative, um, and you get this identity that the ratio between the derivative and f um, is um, just the sum of all these factors coming from zeros. Um, and at a critical point, the left-hand side is zero, so there is a um, basic identity relating the critical points. Every critical point solves this equation that the sum of the reciprocals of the critical point minus all the zeros sums to zero. And using that uh, in just a little bit of complex geometry, you can get the Gauss-Lucas theorem. Okay. So here is just a, a, a schematic depiction of, of the situation. Um, the zeros are in red, and so if you have a certain number of zeros, the critical points are forced to lie inside the convex hull of, 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 of the zeros. So that's one relationship between zeros and, and um, critical points. Um, it's not the only relationship. Here's another basic relationship. Um, if you take all the critical points and you take the average, so you sum them up and you divide by n minus one, that happens to be the same as the um, if you take the zeros and sum them up and take the mean. Okay, so they, they have the same mean. Um, actually, uh, you know, uh, this is really the first hint that probability might be useful since expectations and means are, are so basic to, to probability. But um, okay, but this is a very easy fact. Uh, basically, you just take the two formulas that you have that the, that the polynomial f is the um, a product of factors coming from the zeros, and the derivative is, is a product coming from the critical points, and you just expand out um, um, both um, both products, and you look at the, the first two terms, and you very quickly see that uh, indeed um, um, the two things have to match. All right. Um, so that's another fact. Um, here is a less well-known fact, but uh, uh, quite nice. Um, there was a, a theorem called the perpendicular bisector theorem, proved by Zegel back in the 1920, too, um, which uh, I'll state in a, the following slightly strange way, that um, if you have two zeros, I'll call them lambda 1 and lambda 2, and you, you form the perpendicular bisector. So you, you, you take the midpoint, and you, you take the line perpendicular to the um, 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 midpoint um, between them, that's called the perpendicular bisector of these two zeros, then the critical points can't all lie on one side of this um, bisector. They have to uh, either lie on both sides 
there's some some critical points on one side, some critical points on another side, or maybe um, uh, some of them lie on the um, on the line itself, on the bisector itself. But they can't all lie on on one side. So there's there's a a separate constraint between zeros and polynomial uh, zeros and critical points, which is uh, not covered by the Gauss-Lucas theorem. Um, that follows, by the way, from um, a very deep theorem of um, of Grace, uh, proven at um, in 1900, um, which is a relationship between any two polynomials. That if you have any two polynomials of the same degree f and g, and if all the zeros of one polynomial f lie on one side of a line or one side of a circle and the, uh, all the zeros of the other polynomial lying on the other side, um, then the two polynomials have to be related. Um, there's, there's a certain inner product between those polynomials called the polar form, which is for some combination of the derivatives of f and the derivatives of g. And when these um, polynomials are so different that they lie on different sides of a circle or different sides of a line, then this inner product has to uh, be non-zero. And you can use that to, to prove Seiko's theorem as a, as a corollary. I won't do that here. Um, Okay, oops. So uh, this is just an example of what cannot happen. Okay, so if you have two zeros, which are these two red points, uh, you get this perpendicular bisector, which is this vertical line, and you cannot have all the critical points lie on one side of, of, of this line. That's uh, um, um, another relation. So um, Sendov's conjecture, which um, he made in the 1950s, um, is another uh, conjectured relationship between the zeros and the critical points. So um, if the critical points, so if the zeros all lie in a disk, say the unit disk, um, like uh, I showed in this in this first example, this random situation, then uh, all the critical points have to lie close to, to the zeros. Now, um, in the picture I showed earlier, uh, the critical points were actually lying very close to, to, um, to the zeros, but, but here, um, close, actually the, the correct notion of closeness is, is unit distance. That if you take any zero, uh, every zero in um, the unit disk has to have a friend, has to have a critical point which, um, which lies within a distance one of the zero. So if you, if you, have, if you have a zero called A, then uh, there has to be a critical point uh, within the disk of radius one centered at A. Um, oops, so this, uh, this zero can lie anywhere in the disk. Uh, it's traditional to uh, ro to rotate the disk so that the zero lies in the positive real axis, so on the unit interval between zero and one. That's that's the uh, convention. Okay. So uh, here is a picture of what Sendov's conjecture says uh, does not happen. Okay. So so this is a situation which should not happen. Here, um, the left circle is the unit disk, and all the zeros, which are the red points, lie in the unit disk. Um, and then uh, among those zeros, there's a special zero that we call A, and I'm placing on the um, real axis. Is not drawn here. Um, and then there's a separate disk uh, of radius one around A. And um, what should not happen is that uh, all the critical points, which are the blue points, stay outside this disk. Uh, and they only um, lie in this crescent here, which is uh, the shape is called a loon. Okay, but the, uh, but um, the situation where there's no zeros in this, this right disk is, is not uh, actually, is, should be prohibited. This is what the conjecture says. Okay. Um, so um, why distance one? Okay, so, so why, why is this uh, unit distance the right distance? Well, there are examples that show that this, this statement is basically the best statement you could make of this type uh, regarding the separation between zeros and uh, critical points. Um, so there are two basic examples, um, um, depending on where you want this, this special zero A to be. Um, so there's an example near the origin where, where A is actually at zero. Um, so a very simple example of a polynomial of degree n is z to the n minus z. Okay, that is a polynomial of uh, degree n. Uh, where, what are the zeros? Well, if you look at it, there's a zero at zero. So there's a, there's a, a zero at the origin. Uh, but then there's also n minus one other zeros. Uh, and if you factor out z, you see that the other zeros are just the roots of unity. There are certain roots of unity on the unit circle. If you differentiate this polynomial, you get n, z, n minus one, minus one. And you can compute the zeros, or the critical points. Uh, critical points are, they're almost um, roots of unity. They're roots of unity minus um, a small factor, sorry, times a small factor, uh, n to the minus one of n minus one. Uh, and that's a factor which is almost one when n is large. Um, and so um, the critical points almost line the unit circle. Uh, so I have a picture here. So um, in this particular example, 
um, the zeros, which are in red, uh, form, uh, consist of the origin, uh, which is which we call A, and then some points on the, on the circle. So all the zeros lie in the unit disk. And the critical points do lie in the disk of radius one, centered at, at A, but they only barely do. They're, they're, they are, they're pretty close to actually escaping this disk. Um, so if we were to replace the disk of radius one by any smaller disk, uh, you could, uh, the conjecture would be false, um, at least for N large enough. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one example. Um, another example where now the special zero is on the boundary of the circle rather than the, um, uh, the center. Uh, so now we take the polynomial Z to the N minus one. Um, and so now the zeros are the roots of unity, the nth roots of unity. So they all lie on the unit circle. Um, and among them, um, we, among those zeros is the, is the zero one, which that, that's gonna be our special zero A. Um, the critical points, so the derivative of f is n times e to the n minus one. So uh, you have a zero of big multiplicity, zero of order, so a critical point of order n minus one at the origin. So there's a, all the critical points are at the origin. And again, in this case, Sandoz conjecture is true, but only barely, barely true. Uh, it's, it's, it is uh, um, just on the border of being false. So uh, here is the picture now. Um, the, the, the polynomial, the zeros of the polynomial all lie on the boundary of the unit disk. These are these red points. And then um, the point, one, uh, the special zero A is at, is at the location one. And all the critical points um, with a huge multiplicity are the origin. So that's why I've drawn by this big blue circle. And the, the critical points, they barely lie in the uh, unit disk um, centered at A. Um, so if you were to shrink the, the disk by, by any smaller disk, uh, the conjecture would be false. Um, so here the critical points have almost escaped um, um, the disk of radius one centered at A, but not quite. Uh, they, they, they reach the boundary, but, but that's it. Um, so in fact, it's conjectured by Rodriguez and Phelps that this is basically the, the only way in which Sendos conjecture can even come close to failing. So the, the only way that the zeros, the critical points can almost escape the disk, it's believed, uh, is this example or slight variance of the example. You can rotate this example and you can multiply the polynomial by constant, but basically this is the only picture where Sandoz conjecture should come close to failing. Okay, so there's been a lot of work on the conjecture. Um, I, at least a hundred papers actually. I, I don't know the, um, uh, the full literature. Um, for any fixed degree, like if I pick a degree like 17, um, this is a statement about uh, polynomials of 17, of degree 17, so that's like 18 complex numbers. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a finite sentence in first order arithmetic over the complexes or the reals, uh, actually the reals. Um, and so there's a general theorem Tarski that says that such, such uh, statements are decidable. So in principle, if you had a very powerful computer for any degree n, you could use a computer to decide whether the conjecture is true or not. Um, although in practice, um, the time needed to, uh, um, to verify the conjecture for a given n grows at least exponentially in n. Um, so this is not a practical way to resolve the conjecture for um, any fixed n, except for very, very small n. And in fact, um, the conjecture has only been verified for quite small values of n. So uh, in this slide, you see um, uh, over the years, people have verified the uh, conjecture for degree. So the, the first tr uh, case is two. Um, one is degenerate, there's no critical points when n is one. Um, but for all n up to eight, uh, we have, um, uh, we definitely have um, the uh, conjecture verified. Uh, there have been papers claiming nine and 10, uh, but they haven't really been um, been verified, uh, I think, or accepted by others in the literature. Uh, and in fact, actually there are multiple attempts to, uh, um, to prove this conjecture, which are claimed and then retracted. I think there was even one last year. Um, you know, I think it's, it's like any other uh, conjecture which is famous and fairly easy to state is that it really attracts a lot of uh, 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 attempts, which most of which unfortunately don't work out. Okay, so that's what happens for small n. Um, what happens for big n, uh, large n? Um, there are some results for large n. Um, so for example, there is a result of Bojano, Raman, and Sati uh, that shows that if you make uh, the disk uh, that traps the critical zero, critical points just a little bit larger. So instead of the disk of radius one, uh, you take the disk of radius um, two to the one over n, the nth root of two. Um, then the conjecture is true. So given any zero a, there is a critical point which lies not within one of, 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 of a, that would be Sandoz conjecture, but within um, two to the one over n, which is 
only a little bit bigger than n, um, and as n gets larger, two to one of n converges to one. So in some sense, Bojan of Raman and Sati somehow show that Sennos conjecture becomes uh, almost true uh, in the limit when n is big. Um, this is already a hint that maybe the uh, high degree case is actually easier than the low degree case, uh, despite the fact that much of the progress before it was for low uh, degree. Um, and there are other results that, uh, that have been um, um, established for large n, um, but uh, previous results had to uh, make additional assumptions on the location of a special zero a. So this, there are basically three cases, depending on whether a is near the origin, a is near the circle, or a is somewhere in between. Um, so I just want to summarize some of the, the previous results that, uh, that have been uh, uh, done on this conjecture. Okay. So first of all, uh, I mentioned the Gauss-Lucas theorem. So uh, one immediate consequence of the Gauss-Lucas theorem is that the conjecture is true if your special zero is at zero. Okay. So uh, if, you're, if A is at zero, then this disk of radius one as centered to A is the same as the unit disk, and the unit disk is already convex. So if all the zeros are inside the unit disk, then of course all the critical points are inside the unit disk as well. So the conjecture is true at zero. Um, in 2011, uh, Bojanov um, uh, discovered a slightly improved version of the Gauss-Lucas theorem, uh, which I won't uh, state here, uh, but, it, it's, uh, but it, you can actually shrink a little bit uh, the set where the convex, where the critical points uh, live, not just the convex hull of the, of, the, um, of the zeros. And he was able to stretch this argument and cover a small range of a uh, around zero. So all a between zero and one over n minus one, um, he was able to verify the conjecture in this case by a strengthened version of the Gauss-Lucas theorem. Okay, so this is, uh, that, that's the results that are known for a near one. Um, when a is um, near zero, um, there were several uh, authors, Rubinstein, Goodman, Raman, Ratti, and Joyao, uh, who showed that uh, Senna's conjecture is true uh, when a is equal to one. So if the special zero is actually on the circle, uh, which was in the case in our second example, then uh, they were able to show that Senna's conjecture is true. Um, and then people were able to perturb this result a little bit. Um, I think yeah, Miller and Vajatu Sarescu were the first to show that you could actually uh, also show that a is true for some, uh, the conjecture is true when a is in a sufficiently small neighborhood of one where sufficiently small depends on n. The, the neighborhood gets smaller as n gets larger. Um, and then uh, later uh, people find an explicit um, um, range of the neighborhood. And quite recently, actually 2014, uh, the best range we have is by Kazmauka, which says that, which gave um, a region of size about one over n to the 12th. Uh, that there's a small neighborhood around one where the conjecture is also uh, verified. Okay, so we have those two extreme cases are uh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you can't interpolate. There is no sort of convexity that allows you to uh, to then get all the intermediate cases. Um, then there are some results uh, for a um, in between um, zero and one. So um, Degas um, had a very nice paper, um, which um, was actually a lot of insp which inspired my own work actually. Um, and he used, um, in particular, this perpendicular bisector theorem that I mentioned previously of Zagel. Um, and lots and lots of nice elementary inequalities uh, uh, to relate zeros and, and critical points. And what he showed is that if, um, if your special zero A is far away from zero and far away from one, so if it's bigger than some constant C and less than some constant one minus C for some small C, let's say 0.1. So if A is between say 0.1 and 0.9, then uh, he was able to prove Sandor's conjecture, but only assuming that n is sufficiently large. So uh, only assuming that, that n is, uh, is really big uh, compared to the c. Okay. Um, so uh, he was able to, to establish result for n large enough uh, if you stay away from some 0 and 1. Um, and it was only last year, actually, that... Uh, so in Digo's analysis, he did not specify exactly how a and c were related. Um, but uh, uh, this was carefully done by Chalabgwa just last year. Um, so you can see this has been a very, a quite active uh, area of research. Um, and so he actually gave an explicit um, bound on how large a n has to be to be um, uh, for Diggo's argument to work. And it has to be quite large. Um, so this quantity here, actually, I think it never gets smaller than 2 million. Um, so, um, and it, it often actually is much larger than that. As, as if your zero gets close to A or zero or one, then actually this, this bound goes to infinity. Um, 
but basically what this uh, um, result does is that it verifies Sandoz conjecture for uh, an intermediate range. So there's some large constant C such that if your zero lies between um, a constant multiple of n to the minus one seventh and a constant multiple of n to the minus one quarter, uh, one minus that, then um, the conjecture is also true. So we have these three separate regions where the conjecture is known to be true, um, and this works for even very large n. But unfortunately, there are these gaps, uh, and the, um, that, uh, that when n is large, there are some significant gaps between these three results, uh, which are proven by three very different te techniques, by the way. So there are these two missing gaps that um, uh, that still need needed to be handled. Uh, one is when the, the zero a is close, but not too close to zero uh, in this following precise sense. And also when a is close, but not too close to one in this other precise sense. So these were the two remaining regions. It is a little strange uh, to have a situation where the, the two uh, difficult cases are in sort of very uh, different extremes of, of your domain, but that, that, that's, that's just what happened. All right, so uh, what I was able to do, so I, I still have not resolved the full conjecture, um, and I don't think actually my, my methods do, uh, uh, you have to, to use some new ideas to resolve the full conjecture. But uh, what I showed is that there is some constant degree n naught. Um, I don't tell you what it is, but there is a constant n naught above which the conjecture is true regardless of what a is. So as long as your degree is big enough, um, the conjecture is true. Um, so, um, um, right, so I can fill in these, these remaining uh, gaps in the large n literature, but, but only uh, asymptotically, only when the degree is big enough. So in principle, this means there's only a finite amount of work left to resolve the conjecture. Um, so first you have to work, work out what n0 is. Um, now I don't do this. Um, in fact, it's a little bit difficult to actually uh, extract an explicit value of n0 from my argument because I use comp compactness methods and compactness methods are notorious for not producing explicit constants. Um, but it's, I, I believe if you worked hard enough, you could actually get a constant, but it would be massive. You know, It would be in the billions at least. Um, and uh, we don't have the ability to verify the remaining um, uh, uh, cases of the conjecture in any reasonable amount of time. I mean, it'll be finite, but it'll be like exponential in the degree or something, which is not feasible. Uh, so there's still work to be done, but, um, the, uh, but at least the, the asymptotic case where n is extremely large is actually um, solvable. Um, so that, that's perhaps a surprise um, to those who work I mean, that's maybe the, the, the takeaway is that actually the problem gets easier as the degree gets bigger, once the degree gets very, very big. So as I said, it uses a compactness method, the argument, and it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a method which uh, I like to call compactness and contradiction. Um, it's very popular in other areas of mathematics, particularly PDE, um, which is where I learned it. Um, so um, it's, it's a style of argument which, um, takes some getting used to. Um, I mean, it uses proof by contradiction, which is always uh, a difficult uh, uh, concept to, uh, to explain to, to undergraduate students, for instance, um, that you're, you're trying to prove something is true and you assume it's false, and this is always very counterintuitive. So, um, but that's what we do here. We, to, to prove this conjecture asymptotically, we assume that it's false. We assume that it is not true uh, asymptotically. Um, and what that means is that there must exist arbitrarily high degree counterexamples to Sandoz conjecture, that, that there is, there's some sequence of degrees going up to infinity, and there's some sequence of polynomials whose degree is getting bigger and bigger, um, and there's some special zeros, A, which is going moving around the um, unit disk, and for each of these um, um, polynomials, uh, the uh, conjecture is false, okay, that the critical points stay away from the disk centered at the, um, uh, at the zero. So uh, what you do is that you try to uh, exploit compactness somehow. Um, so the set of all polynomials in the world is not compact, um, but uh, you somehow try to find something which, which is compact. So uh, you have to replace the polynomial by some other object which does live in a compact set. Um, and this is where ideas from probability start becoming useful. And you try to create some limiting object. What is the, you, um, you, you, saw, you saw that after passing to some subsequence perhaps, these polynomials converge to a limit as the degree goes to infinity. Um, and, uh, but this limit will probably not be a polynomial. You have to understand what this limit is, um, and then you, um, uh, you, you, you try to, uh, uh, to say as much as you can about it. 
Um, and it shows that the limit is, is, a, is a very nice object. It's actually a, a pair of two uh, random variables. Um, and you can analyze it using um, some tools that are only available in this asymptotic regime. Um, and one tool that we rely on in particular is uh, the unique continuation of harmonic functions or holomorphic functions. That if, a, um, that if two holomorphic functions say agree on a small set, uh, you, can, you can continue that and they will agree on a bigger set as well. Um, and you can understand the asymptotic limit very, very well. And then you try to go back to the finite world and um, understand what this tells you about the, by the examples, um, the original count examples, to control where the zeros are and, and where the critical points are. All right, so let's, uh, let's see how this works. Okay, so first let's talk about uh, arguing by contradiction. Okay, so as I said, uh, if um, centralized conjecture is not true uh, for asymptotically um, in the asymptotic limit, then there must be a sequence of degrees, n going up to infinity, and for each n in the sequence, there must be some counterexample polynomial f, uh, which we can make mnemonic, um, and it has some zeros, and there'll be more and more zeros as, as, the, de as the degree gets bigger. So there'll be n zeros, uh, lambda, all in the unit disk, um, and there will be one special zero among them, which we are placing uh, on the unit interval between zero and one. And um, these polynomials have the property that they they uh, refute uh, Stendhal's conjecture that there is a disk of radius one um, around this A, and all the zeros avoid this disk. Okay, so they, they avoid the, uh, the disk centered at A, but they have to lie in the disk centered at the origin because of the gauss lucas theorem. So the zeros lie in the unit disk, and the critical points lie in the convex hull of the zeros, so the critical points must also lie in the disk. So the critical points must lie in this loon region. There is, it's inside one disk and outside the other. And we need to show that this situation uh, leads to a contradiction when n is large enough. Okay, so uh, the picture is as follows. We, um, the zeros, which are, so we have many, many zeros. Now we have many red points in the, um, uh, the disk of center of the origin, um, including this special zero at A. And then we have many, many critical points, but the critical points are all deciding to lie over here. So this is a very different picture from the first picture I showed with, for random polynomials, where the zeros and critical points were almost sitting on top of each other. Um, but here, um, the critical points are deciding to, 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 to live all, only in this loon, and, and, the, and the zeros are spread out everywhere, including at this one point A. And this situation is supposed to lead to a contradiction. Okay, so um, now we have the sequence, and we want to say that because of compactness, um, there should be some way to take a limit as n goes to infinity. So what do we have? We, we have um, our polynomials f, and we have the special zero a, and we want to extract a limit uh, as n goes to infinity. So um, in the case of the special zero, uh, this is very easy because we have the very, very basic theorem in um, real analysis, which we teach undergraduates, which is the bosano weierstrass theorem. So the, the bosano weierstrass theorem says that if you take a sequence of real numbers in uh, a compact interval, like zero, one, then you can pass to a subsequence, and in the subsequence, uh, you can make this, this sequence converge to a limit. Um, so all these, um, these, these um, so this special zero, it can move around between zero and one, but we can pass to a subsequence and we can make it converge to a limit, which I'm gonna call A infinity. Um, and so uh, our, our special zero is equal to our limiting zero plus something which goes to zero, when I'm gonna call that little o of one, okay? Um, and this now lets us split into the three cases that we've seen in um, previous work. So this limiting value can is somewhere on the unit interval. So it could be zero, it could be one, or it could be in between. Um, so the limiting, so maybe the limiting value is zero. So that means um, that our um, special zero a is little of one. It, it, it's, it's not zero necessarily, but it converges to, to, um, to zero. Or maybe, um, our limiting uh, a is one, in which case uh, the the finite a is one minus little of one. It converges to one, or uh, a is uh, or the limit thing about is strictly between zero and one. So then uh, a will will be um, bounded from above and below by um, some constant um, and one minus that constant uh, up to some little o one errors. Okay, but um, the third case we don't need to worry about because this this um, previous result of Degas actually um, shows that this case is not. Um, it's not possible for n large enough. So actually the, the only two cases we need to consider remaining are one where the limiting value is zero and one where the limiting value is, is one. And that's just rephrasing something I said in a previous slide. Okay, so in those two cases, we need to show that there's a contradiction. 
Okay, so that's what I was able to do. So I, um, in my paper, I have two separate theorems. Um, so um, so I, I, I introduced two more ranges, which combined with the previous results that were known on, on this problem, we were able to cover all the possible ranges of A and then rule out uh, a completely resolved set of conjecture asymptotically. So uh, firstly, I was able to show that if A is close enough to the origin, and for me, close is um, that A is, goes to zero faster than one of a log N, little over one of a log N. Um, so in this region between zero and um, something small times one of a log N, for example, one of a log N squared, um, then we can get a contradiction. Um, and that covers the missing gap between one of N minus one and the constant N to one, um, N to one uh, minus one over seven, if N is big enough. Um, and then the other uh, result I showed is that if, if A is, um, goes to one, so it's one minus something goes to one, um, but it doesn't go to one, uh, to one too fast, that it's, it's less than one minus a small constant to the N, and this can be any small constant. So as long as it's not exponentially close to N, but uh, to one, but it does converge to one, then I can also get a contradiction. Uh, and that uh, covers uh, the remaining range. Okay, so my, my two results together with three previous results in the literature, actually I guess maybe you don't need uh, this one, maybe just two uh, previous results in the literature um, cover the, um, the remaining cases. Um, actually, the methods that I have can also reprove um, some of the previous results too, so I could also get a self-contained proof, but, this is, but it's uh, shorter to just use the previous literature. Okay, so um, as I said, the whole strategy is to take a limit as n goes to infinity. So we have, to, we have this sequence of polynomials, and we ask, what is the, you know, what is the limit of these polynomials? Now, in um, analysis, of course, we teach um, there are many ways to take limits of functions. There's, there's pointwise convergence, there's uniform convergence, convergence in measure, so on and so forth. Um, these don't work very well um, for these polynomials. Uh, I mean, uh, the limits that you get are kind of uh, boring. I mean, they're either zero or infinity or, or undefined. Um, so just to give one example, uh, you, uh, you take this sequence of polynomials, z to the n minus one, and you ask, what is the limit of this, as n goes to infinity, what, what, what does this, this, um, these polynomials look like? Um, well, if, uh, if z is small, if z is inside the unit disk, um, z to the n goes to zero, and this polynomial just converges pointwise to minus one. Um, if z is bigger than one, if it's outside the disk, uh, this polynomial is just diverged, they'd have no limit, um, goes to infinity. Uh, and on the circle, if Z is on the circle, it, it oscillates. Um, it doesn't go to infinity, it doesn't go, doesn't go to any other finite limit, it just goes round and round. Um, except maybe when Z is one, when it goes to zero. So uh, the limit is, is not very interesting. It's just like minus one inside the disk, uh, infinity outside the disk and undefined uh, on, on the disk. Um, so it's, it's not the polynomial itself that you want to take limits off because you, you, get, uh, you don't get much information. Um, what you want to do is you actually want to take the limits of the zeros and the, and the critical points. Um, but here we have the problem that the, the zeros, um, the, I mean, the zeros, the, the size of the, the, um, the, uh, the, the number of zeros, the number of critical points is going to infinity. It's, it's not just one point or two points. Uh, you have more and more points um, as the degree goes to infinity. Um, so um, the idea is not to think of um, the sets, the zeros individually, but to, to combine them into a single object. Um, and here's where the perspective of probability theory um, uh, becomes useful. Uh, you should not think of individual zeros or individual critical points, but you should think of a random zero and a random critical point. And these are random variables. Uh, and it's the random variables that have useful limits. Um, so here what we do, okay, so for any fixed degree n, we have a polynomial f, we have n zeros, um, um, which we call lambda, um, and we have n critical points. And you just pick a zero at random. And this is a random variable. Um, uh, taking one of n different values, and each zero has a probably one of n of being selected. Um, if there's multiplicity, then of course that zero will have a higher probability of being selected. So uh, I'll, I'll just call um, this red lambda with no um, subscript or superscript, that's a, a random zero um, of f. And similarly, I will pick a, a random critical point, which I call zeta, out of all the, the n minus one possible um, critical points. Okay, uh, and, we, and we can choose these to be in the independent random variables. Okay, so we have these two random variables, which you can associate to every single polynomial. Okay, so for instance, if f is this polynomial, z to n minus one, then all the zeros of this polynomial are uh, n through zero unity. So lambda is just um, a random n through zero unity. So it's, it, it, it is um, the n 
use the unity, spread around the unit circle, and you just pick one at random, and that's lambda. Um, here, all the critical points are at zero. So in this particular case, uh, zeta is actually not random at all. It's actually, this is one of the few cases where, where zeta is actually still deterministic. It is just, it is always zero, because all the critical points in this case are zero. Okay, so that, that's, that's an example. Um, in, um, the, um, in this other example, zeta n minus z, then uh, the random zero, uh, it can be zero, but not very often, uh, only if probably one over n. But, but almost always what's gonna happen is that um, this zero, random zero is gonna be a, a root of unity. It's gonna be spread somewhere on the inner circle. Um, and zeta is also a random root of unity times a small um, factor, n to the one minus one over n. Okay, so we have these two random variables, um, lambda, the random zero, that's gonna be some random point in the unit disk. Um, and zeta is going to be a random point in this loon. It's, it's, it's also in this disk of uh, center of the origin, but it avoids the disk center at A. Okay, so why do we introduce these two uh, random variables? It's because um, there is another notion of convergence, um, which uh, probability theorists use, probabilists use. Um, so beyond point-wise, you don't have convergence and so forth. There's a notion of convergence in distribution, that if you have a sequence of random variables like, like Cn, um, and uh, we say that such a sequence of random variables converges in distribution to another random variable, uh, which I call scheme infinity. If whenever you take a test function, um, phi, okay, this is a typo, it shouldn't be, phi. If you take a test function, a bounded continuous function, and you apply a test function to, um, to your uh, random variables CM, the expectation of any such test uh, should converge to the expectation of the uh, limiting random variable. This is what, what it, um, it means to conversion distribution. Um, it implies, uh, if your random variable is bounded, it implies, for instance, that the, um, the means of Zn converges to the means of Zn infinity, um, the variance converges, um, all the moments converge, and things like that. Um, so it's, um, it's a very common notion of convergence that is used in probability. Um, and the reason why um, uh, why it's useful is because of uh, this famous theorem of Prokhorov um, that, um, like, you know, I, I don't think you know if he's Bulgarian, but anyway, um, but uh, Prokhorov's theorem is um, that if you have any sequence of uh, random variables, of, of bounded random variables, um, there is always a subsequence that converges in distribution. So it's like, the, it's like a random form of the bosano weierstrass theorem. Okay, bosano weierstrass says that any um, uh, bounded sequence of deterministic um, complex numbers has a subsequence that converges. But any random sequence also has a, has a subsequence that converges, but only in distribution. It's a, it's a fairly weak notion of convergence. Okay, but it is a compactness theorem, and we can use it. Um, and um, so we um, uh, okay, so we can pass a subsequence, and so our random zero lambda we can pass a subsequence, and we can assume that this random zero converges in distribution to a limiting random variable, which I call lambda infinity. So um, these distributions converge to, to some random variable. And similarly, um, you can pass to an even further, smaller subsequence, and you can assume that this critical point, this random critical point, zeta, also converges in distribution to some um, limiting random variable, uh, zeta infinity. So, we have, so our, limiting, we, our limiting object is not a um, polynomial, but these two random variables, lambda infinity and zeta infinity, are in some sense describing uh, what happens asymptotically. Okay, um, and they're related to your original um, random variables. For example, uh, all the moments of, um, of your original random variables converge to the moments of uh, these limiting random variables. All right, um, and the reason we do this is because the, um, the limiting random variables behave better. Uh, they are simpler and nicer uh, and have better properties than the original random variables. Okay, so for instance, if I look at our two examples, okay, so if f is c to the minus one, um, in this example, lambda is um, a random n through the unity, which is a discrete distribution on the unit circle, but in the limit, uh, it will converge to the uniform, the continuous distribution on the unit circle. It, it will be a, in the limit, um, the limiting zero, lambda infinity, will be uniformly distributed on the unit circle. Um, the critical points, they were all zero, uh, and so the limit will, will also all be zero, will just, will just be zero. Okay, so, so in this example, the, the random, the, the asymptotic zero is just uniformly distributed on the unit circle, and the asymptotic critical point is, is always at the origin. Um, then um, our second example, um, 
um, um, z and minus z. Lambda, uh, the, the random zero, it, it can be zero, but not very often. It, it's only zero with probably one of n. So asymptotically, actually, it's never zero. Um, or it's an n through unity, n minus first through unity. Um, so in the limit, um, lambda infinity will just be uniformly distributed on the inner circle. You will, um, the limit will forget about the zero at, at zero and only rem remember, remember the zeros on the inner circle. Um, zeta, in this case, is a root of unity times a constant, but this constant goes to one as n goes to infinity. Um, so um, the random critical point is also uniformly distributed on the inner circle. So, so even though the critical points and zeros are different for finite n in the limit as n goes to infinity, um, in some sense, the critical points and the zeros converge to the same thing. Okay. So here I just sort of drew a very schematic diagram. Um, so in the first example, um, the, um, the zeros are, the, in the limit, the zeros are uniformly distributed on the inner circle. So I, I've, I've uh, uh, depicted that by this sort of irregular um, um, smear on the inner circle. This is my, my uh, notation for a, a, a probability distribution. Uh, whereas the critical points, uh, are, they're all sitting at the origin. So th this is what the two limiting objects look like when you take the limit of zeta minus one, and a is converging to the point at one. Um, and in if instead you take zeta minus z, um, then the special zero converges to to, uh, to zero, so a is at zero, but the critical points and the zeros, the, their limiting distribution, they're, they're just both uniformly distributed on the unit circle. So that's the other picture that uh, shows up in our two examples. Okay, so, um, these two random variables are very connected to um, the polynomial f. So, um, so I, I came at this problem from the, the random um, the um, random polynomials literature, and it turns out that um, all the progress, um, well, a lot of the progress on um, random polynomials uh, comes from trying to relate um, the polynomial to these random zeros and random um, uh, critical points um, using potential theory, actually. Um, so um, remember the, your, the original polynomial f is just is, is related to these is a product of, of terms related to, to the zeros. Um, so one way to exploit this identity is to take logarithms to turn this product into a sum, and then you can divide by n so you can turn the sum into a mean. Uh, uh, you can also take reciprocals as convenient, uh, and so you can arrive at this identity that if you take this normalized logarithm of the function f, so you take f absolute value reciprocal log divided by one over n. So this expression is um, what's called the log the potential of the random zero zeta. So um, you take zeta and you take the log of one over the distance between z and zeta for any z, and you, you take the, ex the expected logarithmic distance to uh, a random zero, uh, and that's some function of z. Uh, this has a name, it's, it's called the, the logarithmic potential of lambda, and I'll call it u lambda of z. Um, so it's a basic object that's studied in, in potential theory. And so what we see is that the logarithmic potential of the um, random zero tells you the, it controls the magnitude of the, um, tells you how big the, the, the polynomial is, that the magnitude of the polynomial is controlled by the log potential of, um, of C. But you have to normalize the, um, uh, the magnitude first before you, you see the relationship. Um, and there's a very similar relationship. The log potential of the of the critical points controls the magnitude of the derivative. So the um, yeah, so so lambda tells you how big f is, and zeta tells you how big f prime is. Um, there's another um, 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 identity that's also very important. If you take again this factorization, if you take the logarithmic derivative, so you take log and then differentiate, or equivalently, if you take f prime over f that also converts this product into a sum. And if you normalize your divide by n, you see that the normalized log derivative um, is actually the expected value of one over z minus lambda. And this also is a well-studied object. This is called the cauchy stilches transform of lambda, and I'll denote it S lambda of z. So this is another transform of, um, of, 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 of lambda, and this other transform of, of, of lambda controls the logarithmic derivative. Of, of f, so it controls the ratio between f prime and f. Um, and similarly, the log derivative of zeta, the random critical point, controls the um, ratio between f prime prime and, and f prime. So we get these um, uh, very useful identities. Um, and um, this is important because um, 
in the limit uh, as n goes infinity, um, lambda converges in distribution to, to um, lambda infinity, and zeta converges in distribution to zeta infinity. And there's some basic uh, potential theory that says that, that once you have this convergence in distribution, uh, the log potentials uh, will converge to the log potentials of the limit, uh, but only in a, in a somewhat weak sense, in what's called the local L1 sense. Uh, so it's not quite point-wise or uniform, but it's, it's this local L1. Um, and the Stokes transforms also converge. Um, so as a consequence, um, knowing what the asymptotic um, random variables are, knowing what the asymptotic zero is, asymptotic um, critical points um, are, they tell you the asymptotic behavior of many useful quantities. So if you take the normalized magnitude of F, that will converge as n goes to infinity to the uh, log potential of the um, asymptotic zero. The magnitude of F prime, if you normalize it properly, will converge to um, the log potential of the critical point. Um, and the normalized log derivative converges to the Stokes transform. So if you know what um, the, these two limiting variables are, that tells you a lot of asymptotic information about, so it, it's, not, it's not that F itself converges point-wise to anything interesting. Right? We saw earlier that if you try to take a point-wise limit of F itself, um, you don't get anything interesting. But if you take the point-wise limit of these normalized quantities involving F and its first two derivatives, um, those converge to interesting things. Okay. Um, so I had an example, I don't know how, useful this will be, but um, yeah, so um, yeah, so for example, if you take this polynomial with zk minus one, um, if you try to take limits of this polynomial directly, pointwise limits, you get this very boring thing. As I said, this limit is either minus one or it's it's undefined or infinite. But if you take um, these normalized expressions, uh, you get more interesting limits. Um, so maybe I, I won't go through all of them, but I, I just go through one of them. If you take um, f of z, you take absolute values, uh, you take a reciprocal log one over n, that converges to something more interesting. Um, so for instance, um, if, uh, if z is, is, is uh, in the unit disk, um, f of z will converge to one, uh, and this will converge to zero. So th this expression converges to zero on the, uh, in the interior of the disk. Um, but uh, outside the disk, it converges to um, something else. Um, so f of z goes to infinity, but it goes to infinity at an exponential rate. So as, as if z is outside the unit disk, this f of z grows like z to the n. Uh, and log one of f of z um, is then like n times um, log one of z, absolute value of z. And so this, this normalized limit doesn't go to infinity, it converges to something finite, it, it converges to log one of a mod z. So you get a, an interesting finite limit, uh, um, not it, 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 um, outside the unit disk. So it doesn't go to infinity anymore. Um, and, and all the other objects also converge to, to interesting um, um, functions. Uh, finite, you know, which are finite you know, uh, almost everywhere. Okay, and so it's, it's because we, we normalize things properly. Okay, so there are many, many relationships between these. Um, I'll, just, I'll just mention one other, um, yeah, so uh, if you, an, another way of saying it is that um, the, the asymptotic limits give you asymptotics for, uh, for, for you know, so you can take the, all these previous expressions and like in, in the first, um, identity you can solve for f of z, second one you can solve for f prime of z and so forth. And basically um, what this, um, um, these asymptotics are telling you is that they're giving you asymptotic expressions. They're telling you what the magnitude of, of f of z should look like, what the magnitude of f prime should look like, what the log derivative looks like and so forth. They, they, they give you asymptotic formulas for all these quantities. Um, and you can integrate these and you can get some, some further quantities. So um, another nice um, identity, which turns out to be useful later, um, so, um, as I said, the Stokes transform, uh, the Cauchy Stokes transform controls these log derivatives. You can integrate this, um, use method of integrating factors, and you can also relate the ratio. If you have, if you want to evaluate f at any two points, z0 and z1, um, there's a, a further useful relationship that the, the ratio between f, uh, the value at two different points, is given by the exponential of the integral of the Stokes transform for some contour. You can pick any contour you like from one. Uh, 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 vertex to another, uh, z0 to z1, and that, that, that you can just get by integrating this identity. Um, so um, the point is, is that um, if, if, you can, if you understand the random variables um, zeta and uh, lambda and zeta, you get a lot of information about your, your original polynomial. Um, okay, so um, hopefully I've convinced you that these, these limiting, it will be useful to know what these limiting um, random variables are. And so, 
the first step in um, um, the argument is to actually um, give quite a good description of, of these random variables. So, so initially, uh, all we know is that the random zero is somewhere in the unit disk and the random critical point is somewhere in this loon. But, um, okay, but if, uh, the, uh, if, if you need the origin, if A is converging to zero, so the limiting A is, is zero, um, then uh, uh, there's actually, um, the situation is much more constrained. In, in fact, um, the random zero and, and the random critical point, first of all, they have to converge to the same distribution. So um, asymptotically, they are the same. They, they have the same distribution and they both live on the left semicircle, uh, the semicircle, the left half of the unit disk. Um, so that's what happens if you need the origin. And if you need the unit circle, what must happen is that um, the random zero is uniform, it spreads out and is uniformly distributed on the unit circle. And the random critical point um, converges to zero. It is almost surely zero. Um, so actually, uh, we prove more precise things than this, but this is, this is the basic gist of, of what, what is proven. Okay. Um, so why can we do this? Like, why, why, um, why is the asymptotic limit better um, to uh, than the non-asymptotic um, objects? And it's the reason, the reason is that in the limit, certain things go to zero. Um, so for example, I already told you that uh, there are these relationships that the, um, the logarithmic potential of the zeros is related to um, the magnitude of f, and the logarithmic potential of the critical points is related to the magnitude of f prime. And this cauchy sutras transform of the zeros is related to the ratio between f prime and f. But um, so the, um, these are these three equations, but there are these two unknowns, f of z and f prime of z. And so um, there must be some relationship between these three quantities. So if you take the, the log of the, of the third um, point and you compare it to the second, uh, and you do some loop of algebra, you find that um, there is a connection between the um, critical points and the zeros. Um, the log potential of the critical points is equal to some constant times the log of potential of the zeros plus another constant times um, the log of, of the sort of transform. Right? This just follows from playing around with, with, this, um, with these identities. Okay, so that's a formula. Um, so for any fixed n, you could try to use this formula, but it's a little bit messy. Um, but the um, but what you observe is that if you send n to infinity um, in the limit, uh, this third term should go to zero because uh, this, the the Stilter's transform the lambda is is converging to a limit. Uh, the Stilter's transform is converging at least logarithmically in L one to a limit. Um, but then there's one of n going to zero, and this n minus one of n factor is going to, to one. So what you would expect when you pass to a limit is that um, in the limit, you get a much simpler formula that the log the potential of the, um, um, uh, of, of the asymptotic zero is equal to the log the potential of the asymptotic critical point. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, this is, you, you can't quite justify this. Uh, there's a problem because sometimes the Stilter's transform gets very close to zero. Um, and it gets, if it gets so close to zero, the, the log uh, does not go to zero um, fast enough. It, um, like if, 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 you are, if the Stilter's transform is exponentially close to zero, this, this factor can actually converge to something non-zero. So um, it turns out that, that this um, prediction is not always true. Uh, but what you can prove is that if you're outside the disk, if you're outside the unit disk, if you, then you're away from the zeros and the poles, and the Stilter's transform you can show stays away from zero, um, and um, and then you, uh, this actually makes sense. Okay, so so outside the unit disk at least, um, so these two logarithmic potentials they are not they don't agree everywhere, but they do agree um, away from the origin. So outside uh, outside the unit disk, um, this is true. Okay, so for example. Um, in this example that I, I gave before, of, um, where um, the zero is distributed on the unit circle and the critical point is distributed only the origin, um, you can compute the log potentials. Um, the log potential of, of lambda is uh, log of max one of z. So it, it vanishes in the disk and it grows logarithmically outside the disk. But whereas the, um, the log potential of the critical points is log one of z everywhere. So it, it grows logarithmically outside the disk and inside the disk it converges logarithmically to zero. So inside the disk, these, these potentials disagree, but outside the disk, they agree. So in some sense, if you look at the zeros and the critical points from far away, they look the same. But if you look too close, they can be different. Okay, so 
what does this mean? Okay, so um, so then you can start uh, opening up your books on potential theory. Okay, and say, okay, so suppose you have two random variables and their potentials agree, uh, at least uh, outside the unit disk. What does this mean? Um, well, it implies many things. Um, you can do a Taylor expansion in infinity, uh, and what you find, for example, is that all the moments agree. Um, that that um, so we, we already knew that the mean of lambda and the mean of theta had to agree, but now also the variance have to, have to agree. Well, at, at least sorry, uh, not the variance, but the, the expectation of the square must be the uh, must agree. Expectation of third power must agree. Um, now, if if we had uh, real random variables, uh, then having all the moments agree means that they, these two variables have the same distribution. Um, unfortunately, for complex variables, um, having having moments agree don't um, doesn't necessarily imply that the distribution is the same. But still, this is a very strong statement. Um, it also tells you, by the way, that the, the cauchy stokes transforms agree outside the disk. Uh, you can basically just differentiate um, the log potential to get the Stokes transform. Um, but there's a very nice interpretation from probability. Um, so um, there's this notion of, um, uh, which is, has this very appealing you know, bal balayage, um, which I think actually means to like wash your hair or something, um, uh, or to, to sweep out. Um, but uh, let's see, I'll draw a little picture here. So uh, if you have a disk, radius r, okay, and if you, ha you have some random variable, which is supported in this disk. So if there's, there's a random variable, which you call eta, which is living in this disk. Uh, so um, you can form what's called the, called the balayage of lambda. So you, it's, it's, you're sweeping out lambda to, um, to the boundary of this disk. It's called the, the um, and um, the way you define this is that you, 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 you start with your random point eta inside this disk, um, and then you, uh, you take a random Brownian motion starting at that um, point eta, uh, and eventually this Brownian motion will, will hit the boundary of this disk. And where this point, um, and there'll be some random point on, 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 this, on, this, on this boundary, and that random point is called the balayage. Uh, actually, uh, technically, it's, it's the density, the probably density of, 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 the, of this distribution is, 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 the, is the balayage. Um, so it's, it's basically, uh, um, yeah, if you randomly walk from, from the, your random point, um, you will eventually hit the, the boundary, and um, that boundary is, um, the distribution of that boundary is called the balayage. Um, in terms of potential theory, um, the, um, the balayage is the unique density on the boundary of the circle which has the same log potential, so that the, the, poten the log potential of um, the balayage and the log potential of your original random variable, yeah, um, they agree, um, but only they only agree outside the disk. They can disagree inside the disk. Okay, so for instance, if um, uh, if your random variable is only centered at the origin, um, then the rounding motion will, will hit uh, the boundary uniformly, and the, the balayage of um, a point at the origin would be just a, the uniform distribution on the um, the units uh, on the on the, on, the, on the boundary. Um, if eta was uh, at some other point, um, then the Brownian motion would be more likely to hit one side of, of the boundary than the other, and so the the uh, the balayage will be what's called a Poisson kernel. It's it's large here, but but small here. It will be a non-uniform distribution on the inner circle. Okay, so it turns out. Um, okay, um, this is a typo here. Um, it turns out that the fact that the um, the, um, the zeros and critical points have the same potential, um, an equivalent form of that statement is that is that they have the same balayage. That if you take any disk of radius r, so I'll draw one more picture here. That if you take any disk of radius r bigger than one, and you look at you, you look at a random zero, um, which I call lambda, and a random uh, critical point, which I call zeta. If you take Brownian, Brownian motions from both zeta and um, and lambda, then once they exit the disk, they look the same. That that they they, they have the same distribution um, as uh, uh, once you once you leave the disk. Okay. So for example, we had an example where the critical points were all at the origin, and the um, uh, and the zeros were all on the circle of radius one. So these are very different distributions. But if you take random walks, if you take a random walk from um, the origin and a random walk from a uniform point in the inner circle, they both hit the um, this slightly bigger circle um, um, in in the, in the same way that the, the distribution of the uh, hitting time, hitting location, they're both uniformly distributed on the inner circle. 
So, um, yeah, so roughly speaking, if you take Brownian motions, if, if you diffuse um, both, both these, um, um, these two uh, random variables, then outside this disk, they look exactly the same. Okay, so um, that's um, a very useful fact. Um, okay, so I can get rid of all this now. Um, so, um, for instance, if you know that the zeros, um, if you know that uh, the special zero A is converging to zero, that's one of the two special cases, uh, you can now um, um, give a lot of information about the zeros and the critical points. So, um, maybe I will just, uh, just skip straight to the picture. Okay, so um, okay, so if if your zero is very close to um, uh, it's, it's very close to the origin, then the uh, the critical points are all spread out. Uh, they must live inside this, this very very thin loon um, between these two circles. Okay, and in the limit a equals to zero, and so the critical points are forced to lie actually on um, this semicircle. So the critical points which are drawn in 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 in, um, in blue here. Um, so we'll have some, some probably distribution on, on the semicircle. Okay, and this is the circle radius one. Now in this, this dotted line here, I've drawn a circle of radius one plus epsilon. Okay, and so um, uh, we know that these balayages agree. So, so the, 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 the zeros, um, the critical points which are in blue, uh, you, if, you if you take the, the balayage, so you, you, you randomly move them by Brownian motion until they, they hit this, this circle. The, the balayage of the critical points and the balayage of the um, zeros must be the same for uh, um, once you reach this slightly larger circle of radius one plus epsilon. Um, and what this means is that um, the, the zeros, the, the, the random zeros cannot have any mass outside of the semicircle. So, so here I've drawn a picture where um, where the, um, the the zeros have a little bit of mass, you know, maybe they have some mass over here as well, but they have a little bit of mass um, outside the semicircle. But you see, if um, uh, if if the zeros uh, had some, uh, if the limiting zeros had some had some um, um, mass outside the inner circle, then with positive probability, the random walk, Brownian motion, starting from um, uh, this portion of, of your distribution, would hit this side of of the um, of, 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 of this dotted circle. But the, um, the critical points which are in blue, the, almost all of the um, um, random walks uh, coming from this, um, um, this uh, distribution will, will hit the left semicircle and almost none of them will reach the, uh, um, um, the, the far side of the semicircle. So you can get a contradiction if um, the um, zeros have any mass outside, outside of the uh, semicircle. And so the, um, the zeros must also live on the semicircle. Uh, and once they both live on the semicircle, and since they all have the same moments, you can use uh, Fourier analysis to show that in fact they must be the same. They have the same, same distribution. Okay, so that's how we control things when A is near the origin. Um, no, hang on, there's a, uh, need to clear, clear this. All right, um, to do the opposite case when A is uh, near one, uh, this is trickier, so I had to use uh, some rather ingenious arguments of Degas, uh, who uh, also worked on this problem previously. So um, um, I won't describe all of it, um, but uh, one of the key ideas is to exploit this perpendicular bisector theorem. That, um, so as I mentioned before, that if you have two zeros, uh, lambda one and lambda two, um, then the critical points cannot all lie on one side of, of, of a perpendicular bisector between two zeros. Um, so that's a general statement. And in our particular case, uh, this gives us uh, what we call a zero-free region. Uh, it, 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 it gives us a nice little region where um, we know there are no zeros. So uh, again, I just draw a picture. Okay. So uh, in this picture, A is close to one. So our special zero is, is close to one. Um, and uh, all the critical points are lying in this um, loon, um, this, 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 this region between uh, um, two, two, two zeros. Um, and then if at these two points, if you draw unit circles between these two points, you, you, you get these two circular arcs. And so there's this little um, um, crescent shaped region here. Um, between these two circles. And this is a zero free region. So it turns out um, you can't actually have any other zeros in this region. So, so here I drew a red a zero um, 
at uh, at this point here. And uh, you can't actually have a zero here. This is this is not allowed because if you had a zero here uh, and you already had a zero at a, then um, you can draw the perpendicular bisector. Um, and a little bit of elementary geometry shows you that if if your point here is inside this this uh, crescent region, then the perpendicular bisector lies to the right of this loon. And so you see that all the critical points are on one side of this bisector, and this is precisely the situation which is prohibited by um, uh, by this uh, Zagos perpendicular bisector theorem. So this can't happen. There are no there are no zeros anywhere in this region here. The zeros can only lie outside of this region. Okay, so there is a zero-free region. Um, now you can work a little bit harder. Um, so let's see, I'll clear this. Okay. Um, so um, you can actually show that that not only um, is your function zero on this region, but there's actually a lower bound. It actually has size uh, comparable to one. It's bounded above and below in magnitude. Um, let me not say why. You have to use um, a quantitative version of the open mapping theorem but I think I will skip this slide. Um, and you can use this information to control um, these asymptotic zeros and asymptotic um, critical points elsewhere. Um, so I think maybe I'll, I'll just um, go to the picture uh, rather than, than give the argument. So, um, all right, so there's, there's a region here where, where F is, um, yeah, so there was a region, where was my pen? Okay, so there's a region here where f of z is basically uh, is bounded away from zero, and in fact, it's, it's basically of size one, as yeah, you can show here inside here. Um, and we also know that this normalized log derivative converts to the log potential of of of, uh, of this uh, asymptotic zero. So um, this log potential you can show actually vanishes on this region here. Now, um, you can also show um, uh, for, okay, so there's some additional arguments of De Gaulle that show that, that first of all, the, the zeros um, have to asymptotically all live on the unit circle. That asymptotically, um, and, and this actually just comes from looking at f of zero. You, you used to think f of zero is the product, the product of all the zeros. Um, and you can control the size of, of f at the origin, and you can show that the zeros, which are uh, this red distribution, all live on the unit circle. Um, which implies that the log, the log potential is harmonic. Okay, so, so that tells you that the, the log potential is harmonic in the unit disk. Okay, and now we can use, and here's where we start really using the, 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 the asymptotic, uh, the power of, of working asymptotically. Um, we have the unique continuation property for harmonic functions. If a harmonic function is zero on some open set, then, uh, it might actually must vanish everywhere inside this disk. So actually, the um, um, the um, um, this log potential actually vanishes everywhere in this unit disk. Um, and then you can take limiting values, and you can, you can conclude that actually um, the zero distribution is actually uniform on um, on the unit circle, uh, which actually then lets you compute the uh, log potential outside. So outside the unit circle, you can then show that the um, uh, the log potential is actually given by this this, this, uh, this log function, log one of a z. Uh, you can also use a reflection principle to actually get jump directly from from here to here. Um, but once you're outside the unit circle, the um, the the um, the log potential of the zeros is equal to the log potential of the critical points. So, so now we also now control the critical points potential. The critical points potential is also log one of a z outside the inner circle. Now uh, you can show that the critical points. Um, actually all lie um, um, on on this arc here. Um, and this comes from, you can use the fact that f prime at, the, at, at a is just uh, n times the product of all the, of a minus the zeros, the critical points. Okay, so uh, if you use this formula, um, and there's some elementary estimates of to go, uh, you, you evaluate what f prime is doing at, at, uh, at the center a, and you find that that, um, that all these magnets have be close to one. Okay, that you, you, can, you can show that the zeros have to all lie on, on this line here, critical points, which means that, that this potential is harmonic everywhere outside of this little arc here. So, um, so once you know that, um, that this log potential is, uh, is log one of a z outside the unit circle, you can also again use unique continuation and show that, that, uh, that 
this log potential is also log one over z, even inside the inner circle, everywhere away from this arc. Um, and this potential only has a singularity of zero. And so uh, if you use put a potential theory, you can actually therefore conclude that the, um, the critical points are all at the origin, at least asymptotically. So um, by using unique continuation, you can show that, um, that the, uh, the zeros are on the inner circle asymptotically and the critical points are at the origin. All right. Um, so uh, we have all this information about the um, asymptotic um, random zeros and, and critical points. Now, how do we get back to the actual polynomials themselves? Um, so in the case when A is close to the origin, uh, what we use is um, uh, the argument principle and Richet's theorem. So these, these classical tools um, uh, of um, complex analysis. And so again, maybe I think I will just refer to the picture rather than um, um, the text. Okay, so um, all right. So so here is our situation. We we, we have um, when a is close to, to zero, the uh, asymptotically the zeros and critical points are, are living on the um, you know circle. So non asymptotically. So for n for large finite n, the zeros and poles are mostly uh, on on near the circle. Sorry, um, the critical points are all inside this very thin balloon. Um, the uh, the zeros are also mostly near here, but there could be a few zeros uh, outside. Uh, so there could be some density zero set of zeros um, outside this loop. In, in particular, we have a special zero here. Now we have this still just transform. So remember, uh, oops, uh, where is my pen? Okay, so the still just transform, if you remember, is a normalized version of the log derivative. Okay. Um, and the, the argument principle tells you that um, if you take any curve, like this circle here, gamma, uh, that the winding number of this log derivative, or equivalent the winding number of, of this uh, still just transform around zero is equal to the numbers of zeros of f minus the number of poles. Okay, this is the argument principle, one of the basic things we teach our complex analysis undergraduates. Okay, so here, uh, in this case, um, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, I got the way around. It's the number of poles minus the number of zeros, that's important. Okay, every zero has got a, um, uh, every zero of f creates a pole of the structure transform. Okay, so, um, all right. So in this case, the structure transform has got at least one zero. There's a zero A. So if you take a small circle on the origin, uh, that's, that circle will contain a zero of A, uh, of, of F, which is this A. And it will contain um, no poles because, um, uh, sorry, not, not, sorry, uh, not poles of uh, critical points. Ah, I'm sorry. Okay, every critical point of f gives you a zero of, of, of this function here. All right. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so there are no critical points inside the circle because the critical points are all in this loon, uh, but there's at least one zero. So this winding number is, is, is negative. It's, a, it's minus one, okay? But on the other hand, if you instead take the winding number of, um, the limiting random variable. Um, so here, um, this random variable is, um, so the limiting just from zeros is, is only on the semicircle. Uh, so outside the semicircle, it's holomorphic. So it has no pole, it only has zeros. So it's, it, it is, it is, um, it is at, um, non-negative because there are, there are only zeros um, here and no poles. So the winding numbers are different. Um, but on the other hand, we know that, that the structure transform actually converges. Um, to um, the surface transform of, of lambda converges to the surface transform of lambda tilde. Now, if this convergence was uniform, uh, we would get a contra contradiction because Rouchet's theorem tells us that if two holomorphic functions are sufficiently close to each other, um, then um, the winding numbers they have are, are the same. Um, but, uh, and we get a contradiction. Now, um, it's 
a little more complicated than this because uh, our convergence is only locally in L1. It is not actually um, uniform. But um, there's a trick. Uh, um, so uh, you, you get to pick this, this curve. So you, you, what you do is that you, you don't just pick, pick any old circle. You, you pick a circle that's, that stays away from the zeros and poles of S lambda. And if you pick the right circle, you can use the original principle. You can uh, make this argument work. You can get your contradiction. Uh, but but uh, this is why um, I need this extra assumption. Um, okay, so there's, there's this extra hypothesis that, that A was actually um, uh, within a log, was, was within one of a log n of, um, uh, of the origin. And I needed that in order to justify this, this technicality here. Okay, so this is how you resolve, uh, you finish off the conjecture when A, A is near the origin. Um, when A is near the um, um, you know, circle, the argument is more difficult. Um, so maybe I'll just illustrate um, a special example. So uh, we already talked about um, what happens when f is z uh, to the minus one. Um, so there's a there's a more uh, there's a generalization of this example uh, which is very instructive. Um, so you pick at a which is close to one, uh, and you pick any polynomial p of z um, with some zeros in the solution. And you multiply it by a big power, not of z, but of a slightly shifted version of z. Um, so you, you take so in, so in, instead of z to the n, you take z to z a shifted z raised to n minus a constant times a fixed polynomial, and then you subtract off not one, but you subtract off whatever this this polynomial is at um, a, and that will give you to force having a zero at a. So there's a special class of polynomials which is um, uh, was, uh, which is very illustrative, um, and I, I, I worked with these, these polynomials first. Um, so uh, maybe I, again, I'll just go to the picture. Um, the um, this particular polynomial, if you compute where its critical points and zeros are, um, uh, th this particular polynomial will have most of its zeros are on the, are very close to the unit disk. Um, in particular, there'll be this special zero a, which is close to the unit disk. Um, the critical points, there'll be a huge critical, uh, so there'll be one point where the critical points are um, a curve of high multiplicity. Um, and then there'll be a small number of zeros and a small number of critical points um, in this loon. So there will be um, the, this particular polynomial, um, the, the critical points and zeros look like this. Um, and if you can make, if you can fit all the zeros inside the disk uh, and all these other zeros outside, critical points outside this loon, you would get a contradiction to send off um, uh, send off conjecture. So, if you if you want to prove send off conjecture asymptotically in the case when a equals to one, you have to rule out this particular uh, type of, of counterexample. Um, so, you can do this by um, you can analyze the zeros of this particular polynomial by a Taylor expansion. Um, so, this is the polynomial. You can you can work out what the zeros are. Okay, if you have a zero, then uh, you only have a zero when these two um, terms agree, and so you can take logs, and you, you get some uh, you get some relationships. Um, the the uh, you can be connecting the zero of your polynomial f, and the zeros of the polynomial p. So uh, I use lambda j, lambda one to lambda m, to denote the pot the um, uh, the zeros of this polynomial. So you can manipulate this formula. Uh, you do a little bit of uh, um, Taylor expansion. And what you find is that the zeros do lie um, close to uh, the unit circle. So um, these zeros, uh, they are almost on the unit circle, the only unit circle with a shift, uh, and then this is other shift. Um, and you, you you take this um, you take this formula, you, you plug in this um, um, this this ansatz, and um, um, you want lambda to stay less than one to stay inside the unit circle. Um, and after a little bit of um, Taylor expansion, uh, what you find is that if you want to make the counter example work, um, you need a certain inequality to, to hold. Okay, so there are these um, parameters C1 and C2. Uh, okay, so uh, I didn't, um, C1 is the location of, um, let's see, uh, oops, C1 is the location of A, A, exactly, it turns out, oops, sorry. Uh, a turns out to be one minus C one over n in, in this. Okay, uh, and C two is the location of this critical point. Okay, and if you want, um, 
the critical point is stay outside of this disk. Uh, you want C2 to be bigger than C1. Um, so there are these two constants here. Uh, and then uh, there are these um, extra zeros here. So in this, in this example, you have a few zeros that are lying outside, uh, not close to the um, you know, circle, but they're just somewhere in this loon. Um, and if you want all the zeros to lie inside this disk, uh, what you find has to happen. Um, okay. Um, after enough Taylor expansion, you, uh, you find that, that this particular equation, has, this inequality, has to hold for, for all theta. Okay, so as you go around the inner circle and you want to check all the zeros stay inside the, the, the disk, uh, you need a certain inequality to hold. Um, but it's very hard for this inequality to hold uh, because, as it turns out, um, this expression, as I said, this is always non-negative. Um, these expressions turn out to also be non-negative. Um, and that's, that's because the, um, 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 these zeros lie, um, all these zeros lie in this loon. And it, it turns out that in this loon, this, this, uh, this expression is always, um, at least, uh, uh, is always not negative. Um, but this, because of the cosine, this expression has mean zero. Okay. Um, actually, this is uh, because you're on the average, okay, I, should, I, should, I should say. Okay. Um, and so, um, so the, the left-hand expression has um, non-negative mean, and the right-hand side has, has zero mean. Um, and so, the only way that, that this can actually um, uh, that that you can actually have, have this inequality is if, uh, first of all, there's an e equality here. Um, this this vanishes, and all of these lambdas, have, um, these guys have to to um, make to um, one. So, in fact, all the lambdas actually have to lie exactly on the circle. Yeah, this, this is the only way in which you could make this uh, inequality work. Um, but uh, you can still rule out this inequality if you take, um, if you look at Fourier coefficients. Um, um, yeah, if you, um, if, if, you, if you take the second Fourier coefficient of this identity, Okay, so you, you, you integrate it against either two by theta. Um, and you just do a little bit of work. Uh, if you inspect the second Fourier coefficient, uh, what you find is that uh, you must have a vanishing second moment. Um, this is a phenomenon that actually was observed in previous literature, that, that the, the zeros, often the, the, the second moment, the variance, uh, the second moment happens to be extremely small. Um, but uh, this turns out to be um, impossible. And so there's the, uh, the, um, the final geometric effect that ends up being used is that you, you can prove that the zeros all lie on this arc. Okay, but if you lie on this arc, um, the, the zeros cannot, the square sum cannot actually sum to zero because um, the square of all these numbers, um, when you square these numbers, they will lie on the, on the left half plane. Um, and they, uh, when you square them, and they can't sum to zero unless they're all zero. Uh, so, in fact, the, the, the only case which is at all problematic is the case where all the zeros um, of lambda lie at zero, which is basically, um, so you, which is basically this, this one example, um, uh, you know, so uh, where all the critical points lie, lie at, at, at zero. This, this is basically the only case in which you could possibly come close to, to um, validating Sandoz's conjecture. Um, but that case, of course, even that case, uh, still Sandoz's conjecture barely holds. Um, so this is the most delicate um, case of the analysis, uh, and uh, there's a few more slides, but I think I will, I will stop here because I'm out of time. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to give a uh, presentation here. I think I will stop. Okay, dear Professor Tao, dear guests, on behalf of the International Center for Mathematical Sciences in Sofia, I would like to thank Professor Tao for agreeing to give this talk uh, in our center on his recent results on the Sandoz conjecture. So it was a great honor for all of us to have you as a speaker. And now I would like to open the Q&A session. If you have some questions or some comments, please feel free to ask. You can use the raise hand button or just directly ask your questions. 
I see here Professor Ognyan Kunchev is raising a hand. Professor Kunchev, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vili. Um, I first want to thank uh, Professor Tao, Terence Tao, for the very nice talk and the very nice introduction, by the way, to the topic, um, and also for presenting a very nice mixture of ideas. And I understood, uh, I mean, the main ideas. And what I wanted to make is uh, actually a remark. Um, the remark is about the point of using potential theory and the balayage, uh, the balayage techniques there. I have to say, that there was a very nice group here in Sofia, and maybe you have heard about Dimitar Zidarov's works on balayage and partial balayage. This is a name uh, of Dimitar Zidarov, he's very uh, much now uh, pretty famous uh, among the people working in potential theory and the balayage. And Zidarov and Sendov were friends. That's what oh. I want to say. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Zidarov was 10 years old, actually. Zidarov was born in 1922 and Sendov in 1932. So they, but they never talked about these problems, which is so, you know, Oh, they should have. <laughs> we'll make, we brought them together, maybe now, now in the skies. So that would be also interesting to other people, physicists. Uh, Zidarov was a physicist. He was not, oh. yes, he was a physicist. So he, uh, he actually was solving the inverse problem. He was trying to identify a body, a heavy body beneath the earth and he was using potential theory. So that's why he invented the partial balayage. And this was, yeah, and th this was very important. Actually, he solved uh, theoretically and practically the problem was solved also here in Sofia by his pupils at the Geophysics Institute. He didn't work at the Institute of Physics, but the Institute of Geophysics. Okay, so this might be an interesting to you and also to other people. So thank you for, for bringing together <laughs> Zidarov and Sandov. Thank you. Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great connection. I was not aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you once again. That was that was my uh, remark. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I think there's a one in chat. There is um, one question in chat from have I Mr. Brahman. Tried to Yes, have we tried to work a smells conjecture this technique? Uh, yes, actually, yes. So, so yeah, smells conjecture is another unsolved question about the relationship between uh, the critical points of a polynomial and its uh, uh, and its values. Uh, yeah, I, I did take a look at that. Um, unfortunately, um, this technique. Uh, um, so, I, I need very much this uh, this compactness to get started. Um, and so what's very nice in the send-off conjecture setting is that all the zeros and all the critical points are all contained inside a, a compact set, the inner disk. Um, and I have looked at uh, um, Smell's conjecture, which is, I, I, I don't remember the exact form here. Um, it's, it's like a, a variant of the mean value theorem. Um, but, um, uh, but what happens is that uh, uh, even after you try to normalize things um, as, as best you can, the zeros and critical points, they all go off infinity. Um, and I've not been able to extract out a very useful limit. Um, so th this, this technique, I, w I mean, um, maybe if one is clever enough, one can do it, but I, 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 I did try. I was unfortunately not able to, to apply it for, for that other conjecture. There is a question from Christo Sendov, who is okay. a co-author of Bogovets Sendov and his nephew. Do you mm. see the question? Y yes, uh, right, yes. Uh, I, I know Bosia did propose some additional conjectures where you don't assume that the zeros are all in the disk, but you just assume that somehow on average they're in the disk. You take some mm. a, a mean. Um, I looked at that too, uh, and again, there's the same problem. I don't have enough compactness. Um, so now the zeros can, or just enough of them can drift off to infinity that um, I lose control. Um, somehow, send off, pick just the right conjecture <laughs> that, you can, that you can do something. Um, you, you change it a little bit, um, and uh, then you can't actually make progress with, this, with these methods anymore. Um, yes, I, I did have a, a look at that. Again, maybe there's a clever trick or something. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it could well be that something can be done um, uh, you know, for instance, as, um, um, you know, uh, actually, so this earlier result I mentioned of Bojan, Bojanov uh, and Ratti and uh, some other person um, um, that that if you enlarge um, 
um, uh, the disk of A is one to, to one plus a little bit, one plus epsilon, um, then um, the centerless conjecture is true for large enough n. Um, so they, they said the particular rate is two to one over n. Um, so the analog of that is uh, that weaker result is also is not known yet for Bosier's version of the conjecture. So that would be the place to start, I think, is to first understand that uh, uh, what, the, what can be done there. May I add some, uh, add some words about uh, academician Sandov? Uh, I met him many times, uh, both in Sofia and Moscow. And last time I met him two years ago in Moscow, when he was giving a talk at the meeting of Moscow Mathematical Society about his conjecture. That's the whole talk was uh, about this conjecture. And he was very enthusiastic about proving this conjecture. And he said that he believes that it will be proved in the next years. Unfortunately not, but we still hope that it will happen in the next years. So thank you for your talk. It was yeah. exciting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If there are no questions, let's thank Professor Tao again for this brilliant lecture. And maybe Oleg would like to say some few words at the end. Yes. I would like first to thank Terry for this uh, very, very nice lecture. And because he mentioned that uh, he never visited Bulgaria, please remember that uh, you always have an open invitation to, to come to Bulgaria. We will be very happy here because some people know you and as far as I see many mathematicians they, they you will have interesting discussions here in Bulgaria with uh, with uh, the Bulgarian mathematicians, Bulgarian specialists. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Finally, I would like to thank all participants for this wonderful evening, afternoon and morning. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. We... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Thank, Jenny, you all. thank you. All. Thank you right. all the friends. Yes. I would like to thank also the president of the Bulgarian Union of Mathematicians, Professor Nikolov for his help to organize this uh, this evening and also to to Ludmil. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye to everybody. Bye bye. <laughs> Did bye bye to everybody. Till the next non virtual meeting in Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first meeting. At least I attended. Okay. Vesco, you the Mitrofan. Yeah. I mean, the of Bolnitz, they probably smelled the And at moment, the body. Даже му помагат с кислород да видим. Ще стискаме палци всичко да бъде наред. Да, да, но, да, но. I would like to thank also to Тошко, who did Тодор Бранзов, who did an excellent work. Thank you very much, Тошко. There are still some comments in the chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Jenny, just uh, read this if you want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jenny will read some of the 
uh, a preferably anonymous student to everyone. I'm definitely not educated enough on the, on the entirety of this topic. Yes, the talk exceeded my level of understanding around 30-40 minutes. I also haven't made myself extremely familiar with Chinese literature. I'm really fascinated by the light work that's happening in mathematics and accordingly, I'd like to know why this conjecture was so interesting, important in the first place. From my experience with conjectures, the really popular and worldwide uh, known ones tend to have some pra practical theoretical importance. So how would you describe the case with this one conjecture? What sparked, sparked your interest and kept you motivated to solve it? And how would you explain your motivation to a person fairly unfamiliar with that particular conjecture in case it's even explainable without all of the prerequisites? Thank, thanks a lot. I'm really honored to be able to attend a live talk with such a community. I'm afraid Terence Tao is not uh, in the list of participants now. Because in the room. He has other duties, but uh, I can transfer all these questions which appeared now in the chat to him by email. And maybe he will answer in his blog on his uh, homepage. I may add in, uh, in his blog, Terry Tao answers a similar question. So go there and not only his answer, but also uh, different people from my community have given their uh, arguments about the popularity of this conjecture. Okay. Good night to everybody. You are leaving. Yeah, good night to Alec. Good night, good night.